Okay, how are you? For this beautiful weather, I appreciate your presence here because I, if I was you, I would not come. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the uh, last time uh, I tried to uh, convey this idea that the challenge of portrait painter is to represent an individual, but also to try to express what is permanent in this individual. And I thought it was uh, uh, quite illustrative, let's say, or pedagogical, if you want, uh, to deal with these, uh, this opposition between one individual and one ethnic characteristic, let's say, of uh, the personage who's represented. As if what the painter tried to do is to find a balance between these two aspects. He will represent one individual, but also will try to convey that he is a black woman, she's a black woman, or he's an Indian, or something of that nature, okay? And of course, one of the, the challenge, it is that, or one of the danger, if you want, it is that the, this looking for a type will take over the individual. And for instance, if you try to remember the name of the Indian chief uh, painted by Holgate that I present you last time, you remember with the white sheet behind him and how he tried to remove from him every aspect of his culture and of his uh, environment. Uh, okay, that, that maybe the name is difficult to remember, but even what, what we keep in mind, it is that, oh, it's a representation of an Indian chief and that's it. Meaning that finally the type of taking over the individual. Uh, and uh, you notice maybe also that the three picture that I show you of black woman, none of them had a name. Uh, the one was called a black slave, the other a dark girl, and the third one was a young coolie woman. Uh, and indeed, in each time, these person had, had a personal name. They, they were a portrait. They were not uh, just a type like this. Huh? He, uh, Prudence Edward probably made contact with this woman in uh, the uh, West Indies and, and negotiate with her for, for a portrait and all that. But in the title, this is forgotten, uh, as if, again, the type will take over. And this is a kind of challenge which is uh, understandable with portrait painter when they try precisely to do at the same level these two uh, requisite, if you want, to paint an individual, to paint somebody in particular, and also to suggest something more permanent in his personality. We will find something analogous to that today. But instead of dealing with uh, ethnic characteristic, we'll, we'll deal with physiognomy. And uh, this is again this type of uh, opposition in which, on one end, we are interested to express the emotion, or let's say, the, like they used to say in the old days, the passion of uh, the person represented, but also some permanent character who will be uh, his type, his uh, physiognomic type, if you want. Huh? And this have interested immensely uh, the painters in the tradition, and I will try to evoke that to you uh, by going a little bit back in the past, but you will see exactly the type of problem that uh, this uh, new approach, let's say, on physiognomy instead of race, instead of uh, ethnic characteristic, uh, could, uh, could bring. Uh, the, the opposition there could be between physiognomy and pathognomy. Pathognomy comes from the Greek pathos, uh, Paros means passion, affect, uh, and this will be all the representation of feelings, uh, let's say of fear, of joy, of uh, any, anything of, of that nature could be patognomy. Uh, uh, when you try to, to represent uh, in a convincing fashion the emotion of the person you are representing. Physiognomy will be more stable, will be something that is behind all these expression of uh, emotion but will be more stable, will be more permanent, if you want. And the, uh, the first example I will give you, it's come from the 17th century and by uh, nul autre, I would say, than Charles Lebrun. Charles Lebrun is the official painter of Louis XIV, is uh, the man who is behind the academy and all that, a very well-known painter, uh, a little bit heavy in terms of uh, always uh, giving uh, respect to the king and things like that. You can imagine, you know, peintre de cour, huh? somebody who is uh, quite close to the, to the court and to the needs, so we have to be, uh, to, to, to behave in a certain way. 
And he, he, he thought that he could make a series of uh, advice to painters how to paint the emotion, how to paint what will be the secret, let's say, uh, and giving model like this of emotion. And here, he, he give, I give you one example. He called it uh, l'étonnement, uh, l'estonnement, uh, like in the old French, and it means, well, astonishment or something, admiration also could be. And uh, he is, uh, of course, influenced in 17th century by Descartes, uh, by the, the philosopher Descartes, and he says, as much as we have the influence of the soul on one part of the body, which is the brain, we could find also the influence in the brain of one gland in particular in which, let's say, the soul and the body meets, and it is the, the famous pituitary gland. Uh, they didn't know what it, what it was for, but when they opened the, the skull of people and they look at the brain, the only gland was unique in the brain was this little spitz, I would say, this little thing that have uh, nothing to do with uh, the meeting of the soul and the body like they imagine. But because it was unique, they thought it must be very important. It must be uh, there that something happened. So uh, Lebrun says, okay, at the same time also when we have inside of the brain the most important uh, place or the most uh, crucial place will be this pituitary gland. The same thing in the face, he says, will be the eyebrows. If you want to express emotion, look how the way the eyebrows goes. And uh, so here, for instance, the way they are drawn and all that, a little bit lift like this to express emo uh, admiration was, was, a, was a, a way to express it. But we find also in Lebrun, uh, let's say, studies of eyebrows uh, with maybe at the top one who will uh, suggest maybe sadness, and then a little bit lower down, you will have uh, anger. And uh, each, each way the eyebrows will be situated will be the key to give you the expression of the emotion of the person. Uh, and then when they become quite good at it, they become to mix, let's say here, it's astonishment with admiration. <laughs> and so you had you add your, your skill of, the, of the, your, let's say, masterpiece of each side, and, and then you give uh, what, what they are interested in. Okay, you notice it's, uh, the, the figures are very, very general in a way. Huh? We, they, they could be man, woman, they could be anybody. But what they, they are interested in, it's to try to find the emotion, the passion. And why they insist so much on this admiration, it's again, it's a thing that you find in Descartes. Descartes says the, the admiration is the first passion. It is the reaction in front of something who is surprising, who is uh, astonishing, uh, that you, you, uh, you never saw before. And it is, this is strange, it's the only passion who doesn't have an opposite. Uh, because, why? Because if it's not astonishing, you don't react. Uh, you just see, oh, uh, that's it. It's again my old friend, uh, that come, I know him, I'm, I'm not uh, specially excited or specially moved by the, as if it was something really new, really uh, unexpected. Uh. The admiration, it's a passion without opposite. Uh. Uh, the, uh, to be angry or to be uh, joyful and all that, this you can have exactly the opposite. You can be angry or you can be in the compassionate, for instance, you, so you will have two patient, two passions different but opposite, but in the term of admiration. So that's why they decided this is the first one. And that's why, of course, uh, Lebrun represented many times and suggested how to do it. And then he, he made a, a méthode pour apprendre à décider les passions, in which uh, page after page, he gives you the key to, uh, uh, let's say, represent uh, uh, veneration on the left, uh, uh, rapture in the middle and extreme pain in, in, in the right. But sometimes it's convincing, like uh, pain, I think we are convinced by the way it's depicted, sometimes it's less. Huh? And again, you, you, you notice that the, uh, the, uh, the face itself is very general. Uh, it's very, it's almost like at the level of the species, I would say. The only difference here that will be kept is between male and female, and that's it. But what they are interested in, of course, it is how the face is organized when it expressed this passion or this one, uh, like we will see today, feelings or, or emotions, if you want, instead of that. 
So this is the aspect who is not permanent, who is changing, who is, uh, let's say, uh, uh, very uh, unstable. Huh? And uh, I was surprised this, uh, uh, this winter, I was in, in, in Israel and I went to the Haifa Museum, uh, of all places, and uh, it's not especially important museum. But there was there a video done by Bill Viola. And Bill Viola is a, a contemporary artist who was still living. And, and um, to my surprise, <laughs> he did exactly what Lebrun was trying to do. It's, uh, he called it Six Heads. And if you look at them, it's the same actor, of course, that uh, uh, changed his face like that. And he expressed different uh, feelings like meanness, uh, I, I mean in the, <laughs> the middle on the left there, I think uh, he tried to be as mean as, as possible or tr as uh, joyful as possible and all that. And you have to, to imagine, okay, this is a photo of it, but you have to imagine the real thing is a video. So these faces change very slowly. So it, it starts, and, and in fact, the same actor do the, all the faces there. Say we pass from one to the other slowly and they change uh, place like this. And I thought, wow, this is a kind of modern version of uh, what uh, these old guys were doing. Okay, so this, this is one aspect. Is it, uh, should we conclude that they were not interested at all in the permanent aspect of physiognomy? And the answer is no. But then it's a little bit surprising the way they will, they will reason. They will try to find not just this variation of feelings, but also more permanent character. And he thought, and especially Lebrun thought, that you could find it by comparison with faces and animals. Yeah. And I will show you what it gives. For instance, here is the eagle man. Huh? Uh, he have the, the look of an eagle, and, and he have probably also the, the character of one, meaning very authoritative and very uh, powerful like this. So this is more close to the uh, fascination with physiognomy. Uh, if we could have a key like this that we could find in the face of our uh, neighbors, let's say, a certain traits, certain features, who will correspond to traits of character, we will have a key to discover with whom we are dealing. Uh, this is the fascination of physiognomy. Of course, it's a completely pseudoscience. I will try to show you later. It doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't work, but, uh, but it, it was certainly an interest in, 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 in the time. And Lebrun thought, and he's not the first one to have thought it because you find it in the antiquity already, this idea that maybe by comparison with animals, we could find uh, something about the character of the people depicted. Here are a few others example. The, the old man. <laughs> who looks like an owl instead of, a, of a, an eagle. And here is the crow, you see. So here it's interesting because he put the depiction of the animals near the, uh, near the transposition with a face. Huh? And, and you see the, the two faces on the bottom here are uh, inspired by, by the crow. And he prepared the next sheet like, with the owl on, on the right side. Huh? You have... Also, uh, some characters who are less uh, uh, interesting, like the bull, you see, a comparison with, with, with cows and bull. And of course, all this is translated in moral value. Huh? If you are an eagle, you are okay, you are wonderful, you are above everybody. But if you are a bull, well, you are a little bit stupid, you are, you, you are a good soul, but, uh, but uh, limited, uh, let's put it that way. Uh, so not, not very... Uh, and so he, he made his drawings of bulls and then suddenly tried to find a uh, transposition of that. Uh, the uh, even great artists like Leonardo da Vinci uh, indulge in that, but I, I, Leonardo said very clearly that he didn't believe in that. He didn't believe that physiognomy could be a key to find out the character of people. So when he does it like here, when he, he, he tried to associate a man with a lion, if you see in the bottom of the picture on the right, you will see a kind of a, a short sketch of a lion. He, he does it as a caricature a little bit, uh, in a kind of uh, to mock at it, if you want. Uh, so, so this is because he declared so clearly that he's not interested in that and he found it ridiculous and all that. So we have to interpret it in, in those terms. And then 
he, he, in fact, he's allude to an old, old topos of, the, of antiquity that associate man, I mean in masculine term, to lion, and woman habitually to panthera, and to panther, or, and, and of course, you could imagine what, what, uh, what kind of stereotyping they were doing. You see, man is brave like a lion, woman is a uh, coward, uh, all these uh, opposition that we always had uh, in, in the past like this. And so he, he, here's his, his lion man, but also there's the other aspect of it that if you look in his airs, there is certain little leaves there who looks like, uh, I would say, a uh, uh, wine leaf. Huh? And uh, that's why some uh, interpreter have thought this could be a representation of Bacchus, of the, uh, the, the god of wine, uh, of uh, uh, Dionysios, if you want, in Greek. And, uh, and the lion is very often associated with Bacchus also. And uh, you remember the Rubens I show you last time with the big fat man drunk? He, uh, Rubens took the liberty to replace the lion by a tiger, but it's the same idea. Uh, it's the same idea of the same. So maybe there is also this symbolism here. But there's a long tradition uh, going back to antiquity to this type of comparison to try to find a key, let's say, to, uh, uh, to when you deal with people to try to find their own, their real character. Uh, and, and it is still going on. Huh? The, uh, I remember in my childhood we had a, a, a collection that was called Vu in which uh, we have little leaflets like this, and we were looking at uh, our girlfriend if she, she fits in this category or, or the other. And it, it is, uh, I was putting on uh, physiognomy on the internet just to see what, what it is. Well, there were suddenly uh, thousands of, of sites about personology, a new science of uh, well, completely, uh, okay, uh, bogus, but whatever. And uh, they were selling books about that and, uh, and how to deal with, uh, especially if you are a businessman, you know, you have to know with whom you deal with. Is it an eagle? Is it a bull? <laughs> you have to find out. And it, it, it is still, uh, still going on. Uh, another important uh, man who, who have influenced ideas about that is this Gian, Giambattista della Porta, uh, uh, which is a, an Italian scholar of the time of the 16th century, beginning of 17. And he produced a book I show you uh, his uh, portrait, let's say, and on the right, what is more uh, interesting for my subject, it is the Humana Physiognomonia, uh, in which uh, he gave the key like this. And if you look at this frontispiece of this first page, you will see, I cannot reach it with my fingers, but if you go on the very top there, and it's on the side here, you have three things. And in, in front here, on the other side, you have association with the animals that is represented there. Uh, so for instance, here you have a, a man like this, you have associated with a sheep. Here is one, you associate it with a cat. Uh, this poor guy here is associated with a man. This is not the best thing <laughs> you could happen to you, but uh, anyway. And, uh, and uh, on the top, you have the eagle man, also a little bit further. And a little bit further, you have the bull also, the, the association of the bull. And uh, at the very top, you have the, the rabbit. Yeah? If you go in the, uh, the kind of... Uh, so uh, De La Porta was certainly... Uh, some illustration of his book uh, show you exactly where, for instance, Lebrun took his inspiration, uh, because this is before Lebrun, of course. And uh, another one, oops, the other, with uh, comparison with, with a sheep. Uh, and the sheep is supposed to be a timid animal, uh, very docile and all that. So if you have a man like this, okay, that will be easy to deal with. He, he looks like a sheep, he will, you will have no trouble. Uh, Finally, I want to quote, because it's wonderful English, um, uh, uh, a page of the book of this Sir Thomas Brown, in which you will see he make comparison with three types of knowledge of the time. Uh, of course, all this is obsolete now, but, but it, it gives you the feeling of how these things were approached. Uh, 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 for instance, he says, there is surely a physiognomy which those experienced and master mendicants observe, 
whereby they instantly discover a merciful aspect and will single out a face wherein they spy the signature and marks of mercy. Uh, he says, so there's people who know it's like that to be able to recognize somebody who is merciful. Uh, it's a, there's certainly a physiognomy, certainly a science of that type of, uh, of uh, consideration. Uh, and he continues saying that, uh, uh, for there are mystically in our faces certain character which carry in them the motto of our souls, wherein he that cannot read ABC may read our nature. Uh, it's wonderfully written. It's, uh, it, uh, Brown is admired by people like Louis Borges and uh, by Virginia Woolf and things like that. I, I'm not astonished because he, he writes so, so beautifully. And then he continues, I hold moreover that there is a phytognomy or physiognomy not only of men but of plants. Uh, uh, this is an interesting idea also, that God has created the plants and the, he has put with his finger on the plants some indication of their usage. Uh, if, for instance, uh, you have a, a, a plant uh, who is good for coughing or to, to heal you for coughing, you will have little shape of lungs on the leaves. Uh, so you look at it, ah, okay, so that must be good for, for if I have a bad cough. Uh, they were using also the walnut, uh, you could guess for what, for uh, crazy people, uh, because it looks like a brain. So you open the walnut, oh, and it's shaped like a brain. So if you have some brain trouble, well, you eat walnuts, you know, you will, it, it will solve it. So this is, this, is, uh, this medicine, which is completely obsolete now, but was very important at the time, was called, the, uh, in French we say, doctrine des signatures, meaning that it, it's on each plant, God has given us the, the key of their, of their usage. Uh, that uh, otherwise, it, it would be an absurd world, and you should have to, just to observe them carefully, and you will know what, what, what they mean. And he says, so the same way, Physiognomy is like that also. God has created types of people in order that we will know how to deal with them. Uh, and the third example he give, it is chiromancia, meaning the, the line of the, of the hands. Uh, God also writes in our own hands exactly wh what our future will be and all that, and we just have to know how to read this. Uh, so these are three pseudoscience, let's see, but were very, uh, taken very seriously at the time, and uh, in which this... Uh, uh, consideration on physiognomy could make sense, uh, and Brown certainly expressed it beautifully. The, if you go further in time and we come much closer to our people uh, to, to hear, I'm sorry if it's a long, long introduction today, but anyway, I got so involved in this, I find it so funny, and uh, <laughs> I just, the hell with it, I will speak of that. The, um, the, uh, the, if you go closer to us in 19th century, the big, uh, Author, let's say the one who really make it popular is Lavater, this man, uh, Johann Kaspar Lavater. Uh, he's a Swiss, German Swiss uh, uh, vicar, uh, very a little bit uh, fanatic, and you will see why uh, later. And uh, he, uh, of course, uh, did his book first in German. Uh, it's called Fragmente Physiognomische. And uh, in which, uh, and then the book was translated in French, it was uh, translated in English, uh, and I have many, many, many editions. Uh, we count about 55 uh, editions of it. Even there was a lavater de poche, meaning you, you could have the key of, <laughs> of a system in a little booklet like that that you, you wear in your pocket, and then it's very useful. You, you, you look at somebody. You go, Oh, okay, I see, I see how to deal with him. And uh, so Lavater was certainly, uh, but he, what, what he tried to do is to make it more scientific than his predecessor. And he, 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 will, be, he will give a little place to the, this comparison with animals, but he pretended to have a much more sophisticated system uh, to, to deal with this. And uh, for instance, I will read to you one example of uh, an analysis that if, that if you make, let's see, of the upper figure here. Uh, so it reads something like that. Here is a head where the nose and the mouth are in perfect harmony. Uh, the nose and the mouth are in perfect harmony. The forehead is almost too 
extraordinary in comparison with the lower part of the face. And if you read between the lines, this is very, very subjective. Uh, it's how can you really affirm that as if it was uh, clear for everybody. This man is honest and without wickedness, but he could not be a great intellectual. <laughs> I like this, I said, this is wonderful <laughs> that you could get like this. It's such a precise uh, description uh, by just looking at this and listening to Lavater. Apparently, some author have used Lavater, I mean uh, novelists, for instance, like Balzac, for instance, have used Lavater when he chose to uh, depict a character. Uh, say, for instance, the Père Glorio or people like that, how they should look. Okay, you go to the Lavater, he's an avaricious man, he's uh, sticking to his money and all that. Okay, so then finally you find a, a good physical description of him and you use it in your novel. Uh, uh, the, the one on the lower aspect, uh, Lavater is absolutely delirious about the nose of this man. And you will understand why a little bit later when I will show you the portrait of Lavater. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you get the feeling a little bit of how, how it is. The way he obtained these, uh, uh, these uh, classification, let's say, was a little bit weird. He, he collected thousands of, of pictures of people that he had engraved like this, all the same with profiles and uh, accumulated like this. Like here is a bunch of six clerics. Uh, and, and the idea will, will be, of course, to find what is common to all of them and will help us to define the perfect cleric, if you want. So let's say, for instance, he, he thinks that the best one here is this one. He, he chooses a lot of people who are probably very good and all that. And this one, this poor guy, is a little fatter and all that. This is a very nice idealistic man. He, he will never be a great cleric like this one. So then you get, you get to your type slowly like that. And there is why I speak of a more scientific approach, because he tried to remove all others' aspect, let's see, any emotion, any passion, nothing of that kind. You just get a profile as cool as possible. And then he discovered that there was a way even to go further than that when a man, a well-named guy, who's called Silhouette, uh, Monsieur Silhouette, who had uh, started the, the fashion of having people um, drawn just with their shadow. Then you remove, of course, everything else except the profile and the... So th there was a machine to do it. You see, you ask uh, uh, the lady to, or the, the man to sit like this. You have a, a candle that projects your, your shadow. And the painter is on the other side and was tracing exactly just your, your shadow. And for Lavater, this was great because it eliminated everything except, let's see, what would be the permanent character what he called the physiognomy and not the pathognomy, uh, not the emotion and things like that. And, uh, and uh, here you have, uh, this is his self-portrait, okay? This is his portrait and this is his shadow. Uh, and uh, on the top, of course, this is kind of measurement that he makes and pretend to be very mathematical and all that. This is, of course, bullshit, but anyway. And uh, <laughs> so you see him. Say the truth, but with charity. Aletheia, huh? <laughs> it's uh, truth. Aletheia. And agape, maybe you heard the name in different contexts, means charity. Alors, be, be truthful, but in charitable. And uh, he, he, the, the funny thing, if you consult his own book, his uh, face corresponds to a, a rather mean man. <laughs> And uh, he, he, if you apply his own medicine to him, he, he, he will describe himself like a hateful character of the miser. Uh, <laughs> egoistical, hard-hearted, and mistrustful, <laughs> which is not very good for, for, uh, for him. But you uh, he, he, he have another, there's another famous example of La Lavater uh, depiction. It is that at the time, in Germany, in uh, especially, there was uh, Moses Mendelssohn that uh, 
maybe you don't know him directly, but you know one of his descendants, who is the, the musician, the Mendelssohn. And this Moses Mendelssohn was uh, a practicing Jew, but also very interested to the enlightenment of, the, uh, of that period and wanting to open Judaism to modern uh, life. I think I don't caricature him saying that. He was himself an observant uh, Jew. He, he didn't uh, change his uh, behavior and all that, but in terms of uh, o uh, opening of spirit and all that, and here on the right, you see Lavater trying to convince him of Christianity under the gaze of Lessing, who was a, a friend of uh, uh, Mendelssohn. Uh, and Lavater wa was, a, I told you, was a kind of a Protestant priest, a, a kind of Protestant pastor. Uh, and he, he was convinced that uh, the Messiah will come back when all the Jews will be converted to Christianity. <laughs> Tough luck. <laughs> <laughs> it will take time. <laughs> anyway. And he, so he was convinced of that, and he, he says, if I can convert only one, uh, will be this Moses Mendelssohn, because after all, he's a very uh, good fellow, and he's, he's very well known, he's a writer, he's a philosopher, and he, he was called the Socrates of Germany at the time, so really he was an important a thinker. And he says, if I can succeed to him, and uh, Goethe at the time uh, hated Lavater to have tried that, he says, so, uh, villain, and so why to do this? Uh, why to try to convince? And uh, there is an exchange of letter between um, Mendelssohn and Lavater in which uh, Mendelssohn says, I am a Jew and I want to stay as such, don't bother me with this. And all his friends says, you should make a reply against him. But he didn't want, but one of his friends did. Uh, the, the title who is this guy? No, it's, it's a, yeah, a guy who's called Lichtenberg. Uh, write a little pamphlet against Lavater in which it was uh, written like this. Timorus. Timorus means in Latin uh, the fearful one or something. The defense of two Israelites who overwhelmed by Lavater proof and the taste of pork sausages converted the only true faith. <laughs> Hello, he, he, he created this little pamphlet and... Uh, in which he attacked him. Uh, the, the last question I was asking myself about Lavater, did he believe also in the comparison with animals? And I find this nice uh, illustration in his book in which uh, you see start with Apollo and then slowly we go to the frog. You see by uh, all the intermediary here. Uh, and uh, for him, the frog was the, the most ugly animals. Uh, and uh, then again, he could classify all these uh, people that way. The one who will attack, let's say, the, the first serious attack of this type of uh, approach to the character of people is surprisingly uh, one of the great philosophers, um, uh, Friedrich Hegel, in his book, Phenomenology of Spirit, in which, to my surprise, there is a chapter about physiognomy and phrenology. Phrenology, you will see, it's another of these craze where people could tell you your, uh, uh, your character or your future even by uh, looking at the bumps of your skull. Huh? And the uh, same type of, uh, of approach, if you want. And Hegel have this, this idea that, that we have to make a difference between, let's say, traits of character who could be sign of what you are, huh? and other traits of character, a feature of your face that could be an effect of what you are. And this is, of course, the confusion that we have always with physiognomy, that we take what is, in fact, effect for signs, uh, as if the, the, uh, the, ca the uh, let's say, the face could reveal in advance what you will do. Uh, and he quoted this Lichtenberg that I just mentioned, in which I think it, it makes it very clear. He said, if anyone said, Certainly, you behave like an honest man, but I can see from your face that you are compelling yourself to do so, and you are a villain underneath. Uh, there is no doubt that every brave fellow so greeted will reply with a box on the ear. Uh, if, you, if you are told, you behave like an honest man, but I know, because I read Lavater and all these people, that in fact you are a villain, and in the underneath you are a bad man. He says, if somebody tells you that, you, you, are, you, you could just spank him. And, uh, 
And, and, and this, you understand, uh, the, this kind of uh, division uh, between what is, could be a sign of something and what is the effect of something. That somebody will have, uh, let's say, uh, a lot of um, woos and uh, a lot of problems and all that could look depressed. Okay, this, this makes sense. In a way, what, what we see in the face, it is not the sign of the character, but the effect of the character. What, uh, the, what the body does, it, 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 it's, uh, it's a body who have been modeled by the soul, if you want, uh, and not the, the, the other way around. And this is the fallacy, of course, of this physiognomy uh, things, but n nevertheless it have, as I tried to show you, an, Im uh, an important uh, influence in, in terms of uh, ideology and all that. But, and, and then the other thing also, you could, somebody who, who knows all this could fool also the, the, the physiognomist. Huh? And uh, uh, there is a painter who tried to demonstrate that. Okay, it's the same guy who will make different portraits of himself but suggesting completely different type of character. Uh, he's not a very well-known painter, so Joseph Ducreux. Uh, what a name, Ducreux, of course. But <laughs> anyway, uh, so he presents himself here as the, the mocker, if you want, or the, the one who, who laughs uh, at you, or the very discreet one uh, on, the, on the right side, uh, the cautious one. is the same guy, of course, but we'll have all the traits that uh, a man like Lavater will, will, will classify in one direction or the other. So there, uh, this possibility of playing uh, the, your character, and if you are a good actor to succeed to do it, well, uh, then uh, again, it's a kind of uh, counterproof of uh, what uh, all this tradition was saying. The same Ducreux did a wonderful picture of a yawning man but this is a, a thing that I don't suggest you, if you ever t teach, to use too long in a class, huh? <laughs> because it have a kind of uh, uh, an effect on the public. So, but uh, anyway, okay. So now we come to our Canadian stuff after this long interpretation. The the painter, I would say, who certainly was interested in this type of problematic, is Ozias Le Duc, huh? and one of the reason I. I think so, I will try to show you in, his, in some of his portrait, but also one of the, the, the painting who seems to really indicate an interest of that kind, it is this one, it's called the Phrenology. Uh, I don't know if Le Duc read about Lavater or things like that, but he was certainly interested in Phrenology. Uh, phrenology is very parallel to physiognomy. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit the same type of, of science. It was created by a man who's called Joseph Gall in the 18th century, and he was on a way uh, on an interesting type of discovery. We know that in our brain we have certain uh, place, uh, certain localization, you see, in the brain who are responsible of certain aspect of our behavior. But uh, he thought that this will be readable at the level of the skull already, huh? so all the bumps. So, uh, so they created a kind of science like that, and you are phrenologists, you could, you could go to them, and especially mother came with her children, and he says, what will happen to him, you know? He, he did he have the bump of mathematics, for instance, it's very important to know in, uh, in advance, instead of selling them in the hard school or things like that, you see, if you find right away that you have the bump of maths. And what you see in the picture of, of Le Duc, it is at, the, uh, at the, the very center, this phrenological bust uh, in which you have on a skull little area marked with numbers. And of course, this corresponds to a chart where they will t the, uh, the phrenologist was told, don't forget this is for uh, a sign of this or that. So if you have a bump there instead of there, well, it, you, you could then identify the character of the people. I think that in this picture, the Duke used it as a kind of symbol of painting itself. Because if you think of it, painting is something material. Huh? It's something done with pigments. But it's also convey a uh, meaning, convey an idea. Huh? So a little bit like phrenology, it is what these uh, material aspect of the skull, let's say, are conveying a certain content, uh, a more ideological content, let's say a character. Uh, so I thought he used it as a symbol of painting. And why I think of that? Because he accompanied the representation of this bust with other aspects also of painting, like you see here, instrument of uh, drawing uh, on this side, using the space to measure. And on the other side, you have cubes of painting, and you have a glass with the 
with a brush. So uh, I, I think that the, the real theme of la phrenology of this picture is a reflection about painting. Painting as, uh, I would say, a craft that where you need instrument to draw and to paint, but also as a science. Huh? And that's why also if you look That's probably then the, uh, uh, the aspect of uh, painting as a science, as something like phrenology, where with matter you can get to spiritual content. And finally, in the background, you have a kind of symbolic uh, representation. Uh, we finally found out where he took it. It's a little picture by a man called William Frost, who is uh, very obscure. But uh, anyway, uh, Le Duc liked this painting. It's a representation of a river in England, it's called the Severn, with all these affluent, but represented symbolically by women uh, and uh, circled by other women. So then you have a third meaning of the painting. Painting is a métier, uh, is something is a craft, is a science, but is also a spiritual, is also symbolical. Uh, so he used phrenology in that context, but on the other hand, he knew what it was. And the other thing that is interesting, it is that phrenology was condemned by the church at the time. Why? Because it was a materialistic type of approach to spirituality. Huh? Since you could find uh, spirituality through matter, uh, through the, the skull. Uh, so that Le Duc could indulge in that, him who lived practically with church painting, I think it's interesting. It makes a, okay, so how it will tra be translated in painting of which closer to portrait. And the first thing that Le Duc was interested in it is how to depict interiority, how to depict something that happens inside and not only, okay, the painter have to deal only with appearances, but how he can get to, to suggest certain interiority. The first solution he tried, it is through, I would say, almost a body language. Uh, the way the, the personage will be presented will suggest some interiority. And he did, for instance, I'm sorry, I think I, I got another, yeah, well. He did, for instance, a uh, representation of, of some member of his family, like, like this one is uh, his brother, Ulrich. And, uh, being intensely absorbed in reading. Huh? And this is, of course, a way to uh, express interiority because when you read, you are involved in something that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, involved more than just the way you look. You are also involved in something. Say, for instance, it always struck me in the metro, the people who seem happy there are the people who read. Huh? The others are bored and they, they have nothing to see and nothing to... But people reading are inside of a bubble, if you want, and they are, you, you feel that something happened inside. <laughs> There's something, uh, whatever they read. Uh, here, of course, the, the little boy is uh, absorbed in the contemplation of a, probably a hard book because you see there's a kind of illustration and uh, he have a pencil in his hands and even some uh, instrument to paint in the back there. And so these figure of absorption are, are interesting in, in order to suggest interiority. Uh, the, the great uh, art critic or art historian also, Michael Fried, uh, that I suggest you to read <laughs> if ever you didn't, uh, have created this term, uh, the figure of absorption in the 18th century and 19th century painting, but Le Duc have exploited that uh, very well. I think you have another example here with his sister. Uh, I don't know what happened in this family, but they, they like Z in their name, you see, Ozima, poor girl. Anyway, uh, Ozima, come here, yeah. And uh, Hosias, come here. And, uh, well, and the, but uh, you see, the, you have a photo of her on the top where she's reading, and here to uh, a drawing, and let's see a painting in which she's absorbed in this, uh, 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 in this uh, activity. Huh? I don't know if I had before, no, okay. I will go like this. Okay, so that was one way to do it. But then there was a more uh, direct way, let's say, to try to find uh, 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 maybe by the depiction of a face, of the trait of the face, the features, uh, try to find maybe a way to convey uh, a certain moral characteristic of the person. 
And this, in fact, is much closer to what we were speaking before about physiognomy. This is a case, uh, a good example here of that. The, he call it portrait of Mrs. La Bonté, uh, the, Mrs. Goodness, uh, if you want. And uh, in fact, this title is a pure invention by Le Duc. And what happened is the following. At the time, he was painting in Shawinigan one of his last big uh, church decoration uh, in the uh, church there in Shawinigan South, who is called uh, Notre Dame de la Présentation. Uh, so he's there, he's involved in this project. It, this is the last project he will do. He's already a very old man. And he works with uh, his assistant, Mrs. Gabrielle Messier. And both of them are involved in this big project. And suddenly, one photographer of the place come to him and, he sa and he's called Monsieur Loranger and he says, I would like you to paint the portrait of my mother. My mother died, but I, I'm a photographer and I have a good photo of her and that's what he gave him. You see the photo that you see on the right, what given to Le Duc. And Le Duc uh, had many other things in, uh, to do, you see, he was involved in this thing and he asked his assistant, he said, could you do uh, something for that man, make a portrait of his mother and we'll get rid of him, sold it, sell it for whatever you want. Uh, well, anyway, so, th so the man come and he's not happy with it. And he said, oh, no, no, this is not my mother. This is much too artistic. Huh? I said, this is interesting because this guy wanted to have the individual. He didn't want to have anything permanent about her. Huh? So Le Duc says, don't worry, I will correct the picture of Mrs. Messier. Le Duc was a nice man and he says, I will, I will improve it a little bit and you will come. He come back and he still refused it. He's still a stupid man because this thing was worth the millions of hundreds and hundreds of dollars. But anyway, the, he, he refused it again. And so Le Duc kept the painting with him and he, he changed the title. He called it Mrs. La Bonté. Huh? And he, t he tried to express in this picture, of course, this moral quality of goodness huh, by working especially on the eyes, I would say. If you compare the eyes in the photo and the eyes in the picture, you will see uh, the, the, exactly the difference. In the photo, it's just an old lady who's tired and uh, who is at the end of her life. And maybe she was a nice lady, but maybe she was a bitchy like that. We, we don't know, we don't know. But here, there's no doubt on, on, on the on, on the way she looks here, because these big eyes and all that, uh, a little bit with water, <laughs> watery, big eyes, then it, it suggests this. Huh? And Le Duc kept it with him at Saint-Hilaire, uh, where, where he lived, and nine years after, he sold it to the Museum of Quebec for a good price, and uh, poor Laurenger uh, just missed uh, a chance to, to do something. Uh, another example of these so-called moral portrait, I would say, in which you have a little bit the same type of circumstances. It's called Back from the Field, but in fact, it's a portrait of a specific person. Uh, Le Duc was friend with a priest who was called l'abbé Tessier. Huh? This Tessier was uh, what we used to call an inspector of school at the time. He was going from school to school to see that everything is done properly. And he was also a photographer and a cineast. Huh? He had some film done by a filmmaker. Uh, done by this Abbé Tessier. And he had a lot of admiration for his father. He took the two pictures that you see on the right and he gave them to Ozias Le Duc and says, try to make a portrait of my father who for me is the perfect example of a good Christian man. You see very uh, peaceful and, and accepting, let's say, he's a farmer, of course, uh, accepting the, the things as they are. You see, if he loses, uh, crop this year, well, he's resignated to him, he's a very obedient type of man. And I think Tessier uh, wanted to use this image in a way as an example of this kind of clerical nationalist uh, type of ideology of the time. Uh, he, he was the perfect incarnation of the guy who will not make trouble. <laughs> and, uh, and so Le Duc used the two photos, if you, if you compare them, you will see that he used one photo for the head and the other photo for the, for the body. And the only contribution of Le Duc are the little landscape in the background, uh, so very little. But again, uh, the, the project here is again to convey more than just the portrait of an individual, but also to instill uh, certain values. I think that that's important to, to see. Uh, the, 
third example of Le Duc that I wanted to discuss with you, it is this uh, then a very official type of portrait. This is a portrait of uh, Francoeur, of Joseph Napoleon Francoeur, who was the speaker at the, um, uh, the General Assembly, how do you call it, the, the Assembly at the, at the Quebec Parliament. Huh? And uh, at the National Assembly, okay, it's written there, so it's, it's easy, uh, in Quebec. And uh, this Francoeur uh, was an important man, of course, a, a lawyer. And uh, Le Duc was very impressed when he got the commission to do this. He got it to a friend in St. Hilaire, Dr. Choquette, who knew him and knew both and put them together. So uh, Le Duc goes to Quebec City, get uh, some sketches of the man on the spot, and also some photograph of him. And then he come back uh, with this and he says, I will work on this and when it will be more advanced, I will consult you and see uh, what you think. So uh, the photo that Francoeur gave him is the photo that you see on the left. Huh? And uh, if you remember how he looks in the picture, and you go back, oops, you go back to the photo, you realize that the photo shows a younger man huh? than in the picture a little bit. And the drawing that you see on the right is very close the, to the photo. It's, uh, it shows him uh, at, at his age, let's see. And then Le Duc is not happy with that, and he wants to do something else. He takes another photo of him, and this photo will look much older. He's in fact six months done after the previous one. And so you said, what happened to this poor guy? You know, he aged <laughs> instantly. No, <laughs> what happened? It is that Le Duc have aged the photo. Le Duc with a pencil have added a few wrinkles here, a few wrinkles there also, as if he wanted to have a, a more mature, mature man, mature, <laughs> major, whatever, uh, be, uh, uh, at this time, uh, my English can become to dwindle, uh, and anyway. The, uh, so he wanted to, to, to give him a, a more serious uh, stance, so he aged the photo. Uh, and you see here the result in, in one model. Francoeur, he got the same reaction than the, the, the Loranger case. Huh? If I go back to it, Francoeur says, well, I like it, it's beautiful, but God, he says, I'm a 55, I look like a 55 year old man here. Okay? He was not flattered by the, and uh, he says to Le Duc, I don't know, but uh, what was your idea? You see, how, why you hate me so much? Why, why you transform me like that? And Ludic write to him a very nice letter in which he tried to explain his philosophy of portrait. And then it's interesting because it's almost like a, a declaration of his principle, how he see the portrait. Uh, he says, I'm very sad that this portrait seems to have annoyed you so much. Uh, it starts like this. He says, it's not the first time that the work of art is discussed. <laughs> he doesn't say it's not the first time that my works have been discussed. <laughs> so that the work has discussed, okay? I've been put, put as, I tried to translate, but uh, I put my name on this painting, he says, because it corresponds to my intention. Uh, okay, so he learned, then he take over, of course. He says, okay, if I sign this, it is because I wanted it to be, to look like this. But, uh, and to paint not only a superficial similitude of you, uh, but to reveal a more intimate dimension, which is reality also, and a fascinating one. Uh, not only I don't want just to make uh, a portrait of an individual who will resemble the individual superficially, but I want to express also something more intimate, more deep. Uh, and he had, behind the appearances, other significations, in plural, uh, uh, hide themselves, uh, as if 
you could see a portrait like with, done with many layers. Uh, you have the superficial aspect, but behind this, you have what he wanted to convey. Of course, this is an important political man. He, he must uh, look like a wise man. He, he must look like somebody in control. Is the speaker of the National Assembly. He shouldn't be look like a fool and think, or too young and all that. So he wanted, by aging him, giving him this aspect of wisdom that we are expecting from our politician. <laughs> Good luck. In my work, I am looking for the essential. Uh, of course, it's not to me to declare if I succeeded. Uh, so this is this is wonderful, uh, Le Duc. Uh, and you have another little picture, a modello, I would say, of this same man that uh, have been uh, very recently identified as such. Uh, this is Frank Herr again, but it seems to be unrelated nor to the big painting, nor to the drawing, as if it was one possibility that he, he, he could uh, do it. And this one is at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. Of course, the official portrait is in Quebec, is in the Parliament. Uh, and uh, that's it. And uh, OK, the, if I thought after, I said, uh, I should have uh, one example of uh, m this type of moral portrait, I would call them, uh, from uh, the Anglo-Canadian painter. And I thought right away of Harris. And you would say, Harris? He never painted portrait, he painted landscape, but uh, there's few, few portraits by Harris. And especially this one, uh, who represents Dr. Salim Bland. Uh, Bland was uh, a pastor, I think he was uh, first a Presbyterian, but he became United Church. And uh, it's interesting, he was active in the 20s at the time when there was a lot of unrest, let's see. Uh, in terms of workers and, and uh, uh, let's say, boss relationship. It, it was a difficult time. And they had also at the time the model of the uh, Russian Revolution uh, in 1917, not too far away, in which there was a proposal of a new type of society. And of course, for these Christians, this was not uh, possible. And so they tried to get the church more involved socially and more involved politically. Uh, and what they did, they proposed uh, some change that uh, now seems uh, uh, allant de soi, but uh, that was finally accepted by the society. Like, for instance, the, uh, the week for the worker of 40 hours instead of uh, endlessly uh, like before, the day of eight hours instead of, again, 16 hours uh, working and things like that. The uh, Bland was very uh, active in that uh, type of uh, reform, if you want. And so they avoided a kind of complete revolution, if you want, like you had in Russia, by proposing more illuminated type of, uh, of uh, social um, uh, reform. It was also for syndicali syndicalization of workers. Uh, so they, they were proposing all these measures, let's say, to, uh, to ameliorate the situation. He even says that uh, we should replace capitalism by Christian uh, fraternity and things like that. So, uh, but never using the word revolution uh, because it was a little bit touchy. And, and uh, Harris had an immense admiration for that man. Huh? And I think so that's what he wanted to convey here in this portrait, that this is a, a man of God, this is somebody who have uh, uh, been also very involved, very forceful in social reform and all that. And I think he conveyed that well. It's a, it's a, it's a good uh, portrait. The fact also that you have nothing in the background, you see that just impose this, this kind of pyramidal uh, figure like this also goes in the same way. Huh? And third and last example I want to, to deal with, it is some picture by Holgate. Huh? He, he come uh, from one lecture to the other because I, I have uh, all this material on Holgate that we, uh, that we have because of the exhibition we had last year. But the Okay, this is a portrait of his wife, in fact, uh, Frances Holgate. And uh, apparently she was cleaning the house and that's why she had these white things on, on, her, on, her, um, on her head. But he called it the head. And I, I thought this was interesting because you remember that the, uh, when I started the lecture, I, I show you some Le Brun type of head in a way. Huh? That was called at the time the tête d'expression, huh? the, this type of pr presentation at Le Brun. So you could say that here Holgate is, is playing with that, with the head, but it's a head without expression. Huh? It is, uh, if it's a head of expression, it is a without expression, as if she was very neutral in which you cannot really penetrate in, inside uh, of the, 
of, uh, and, and of the person. And what Olgate tried to explain it is we have to get to the structure of a face and not only to, to compose it, but to try to, to really find what is the structure of the face. And with this, you have a few examples of uh, also, like we had with the uh, Le Duc, uh, a kind of how can we convey this interiority? How we convey that uh, uh, a person is not only an appearance or only a phenomenon, but also have a soul, have something inside it. So he got also the same solution. Make, make people who are absorbed in something that they are doing, like, like reading, for instance. Huh? So the, this, uh, this uh, young girl reading a book, it looks more like, a, I would say, an art album by, by the size, but again, completely absorbed in her, in her uh, activity, and in a way, making the spectator neutral, uh, uh, making the, the contact of the spectator uh, severe. Uh, you, you, she is inside of her world, and you are looking at her, but, but she doesn't communicate with you at all. Uh. The other thing which is interesting here is the time you look at the picture correspond a little bit also at the time that the reading takes, uh, as if there was there not only not an instant view of, of somebody, but also a suggestion of some activity that takes time. Uh, and reading, by definition, takes time, and it's almost like to suggest you, you look at pictures, should good time also. Uh, should it took some time to look at it. Uh, and then there's a kind of a, a strange communication between the picture and you, because you are by looking at it, experimenting something of the same nature than the reader is doing. Uh, the, 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 the most uh, incredible picture he did of that, it is of this man who is called Jean Chauvin. Uh, Jean Chauvin was the uh, editor of a magazine, it was called La Revue Moderne, and for many, many years, and a quite uh, illuminated man, he, he wrote a beautiful book on, the, on artists, uh, it's called Atelier, in which he went from artist to artist and interviewed them and make a book around this. And here he's presented, of course, in front of uh, his uh, bookshelves and with a book in his hand, but at the moment when he's, uh, he's uh, disturbed in his reading and looking at you suddenly. Huh? And when this picture was presented here, uh, Rosalind Peppel, who was the head curator for this show, I've thought of making a parallel, which I think is interesting, with a Cezanne picture. And the parallel, of course, is with this picture of uh, uh, Monsieur Geoffroy, or whoever, Gustave Geoffroy. And uh, why Cezanne wanted to, to paint this guy, it is it one of the first critics that wrote a lengthy article about Cezanne. And Cezanne was very touched by that, and he says, I want to thank you, sir. Uh, um, uh, you, that you describe my little attempt, uh, imagine. Cezanne speaking of his picture, comme des petites tentatives. Huh? Well, yeah, well, not too bad for petite tentative. Huh? And, and so he brings this Geoffroy, he, he, he goes in his studio and all this, and with, with the books and a flower, and he, and, and he work and work at it. But of course, during the, the pause, uh, Geoffroy uh, speak with him, huh? what you do, you see, you are there for hours, and especially with Cezanne, long sense of pause. Huh? It's always very lengthy and very, uh, ne bougez pas, you know, okay. And so this guy began to make a fool of himself. He saw so, so many stupidity that Cezanne began to hate him and to say, this is an idiot, what, what I'm doing here, you know. And I, I think we explain by that the fact that he didn't finish the face and he didn't finish the hands either. Huh? And uh, he let him like this unfinished, which give him maybe more power than he <laughs> really finished him, and, but who, who also translate the lack of uh, empathy between the two men. Huh? And he, 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 he never uh, finished a painting like this. But in the case of, uh, of uh, Chauvin, the relation with, uh, with Olgate are very different. They were friends, they were close friends. They, they live at the same place in modern Heights for a long time, and they were exchanging. Uh, you know that Olgate was perfectly bilingual, so he, he could speak, and Chauvin probably speak English too, and, and they, were, they were very close together. So you don't have this type of relationship like we have with Cezanne, but the composition of the two paintings are similar in a way. Huh? You have this kind of pyramidal presentation of uh, the fact that the, the arms are detached like this, 
and the books uh, behind and the maybe less props that you have in the Cezanne picture, but uh, also, uh, certainly a dialogue there was interesting. The, the other painting of Olgate was very touching in that sense also that in which he tried to convey also a kind of moral meaning. It is this uh, portrait of Ludovine. Uh, in 1930, when, when he did this painting, Olgate went on the north coast of the St. Lawrence River, went up to almost Labrador, finally. And on his way, he stopped at Natashquan. Uh, all French Canadians know what, what Nat Natashquan is because of Gilles Vigneault, who, uh, who come from there. But the, uh, Natashquan is a little uh, village of uh, fishermen, let's say. And uh, he come to, to meet uh, this family, in which probably you have to live in family. You, you don't have hotel in, in Natashquan. There's a six or seven hours. Or like anyway, and the, uh, the, uh, this girl, in fact, just lost her mother. She was 15 years old. And she was suddenly responsible of the whole family. Uh, she, she had to take the role of the mother. There was no other. The father is a fisherman, goes on the sea all the time, and she's stuck with, with the little kids. Uh, and Olgate felt that uh, she's a very brave girl. She's a, and he wanted to convey that in, her, in, in this portrait. She is, of course, in mourning, uh, as you see, or the black dress and all that. And he, he, he tried to convey this idea of a very resolute little uh, woman uh, say facing what, what is her destiny now and having the strength also. Uh, I think it's a beautiful portrait. Uh, who is at National Gallery in Ottawa. And uh, Ludovine is her first name. We know that she was Ludovine Landry, uh, kind of uh, typical French Canadian name. Uh, the other man that fascinated uh, Olgate also in Natashquan was the, the vicar of the place. Uh, Father Hulot, uh, the vicar of Natashquan. And this little painting now belongs to the museum, but very, we, we got it very recently. Uh, it is, in fact, the, f the exhibition we did here that provoked the person who had the painting to say, well, I have old gate at home. So, so, so bring it back. <laughs> and suddenly uh, it was given to us here. At, uh, it's a nice picture also of uh, what he wanted to convey. Of course, it's a, it's a man of faith. This guy must have been quite special. He was the vicar of Natashquan. Imagine a little village like that, isolated. He was a Frenchman. Come La, he come from La Rochelle, um, uh, Monsieur Hulot, uh, and uh, stayed there for many years and then went back to France. Uh, he, he must have been a, a character. And uh, what he want, what uh, is conveyed by the picture, of course, it is kind of intensity, this man of God, I think, uh, this is clear. Uh, okay, two more examples, and I let you go. Uh, this, this is interesting because profile, habitually, are also a way to show determination and show also detachment from the onlooker. Uh, when, you, when you see a portrait in profile, you, you have somebody who is disconnected from you and look in a certain direction. We don't know who is this woman is and was. And uh, I put him in parallel with two other uh, aspects because profile painting comes probably from coin uh, at the beginning because on coin you have this the first uh, uh, representation like this of, uh, of profile. In this case, it's Nero, so I guess it's not... A, not a model of this woman. And I thought of the Botticelli was interesting to put in parallel also because you have a beautiful woman also looking like this, very determined. Uh, and, uh, but then I'm always, I'm almost speaking like a physiognomist. Huh? Since I don't have the key, I said, okay, oh, she has a big chin. And I try to find uh, meaning to this face, but in fact, I could be completely wrong. Huh? Because she's, she, maybe she's wicked. I, I don't know. We, 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 don't, we, we don't have a clue, a, cl a clue like we have for the other one. Huh? With the little Ludovine, you can say, okay, she became what she looks because of what happened to her. Huh? Uh, what you see, it's an effect of the situation in which she is. It's not a sign of it huh? because how can she predict it? Here, we, because we don't have the context, we could say, well, uh, we, we go back to always to this old habit of physiognomists, you see, who try to find meaning in the bone structure of people. And I finish with uh, this man who was not blessed by <laughs> beauty, but uh, he, he had quite a chin, 
And uh, it's, uh, it's called Portrait of a Mathematician. In fact, we know who he, who he was. He, he was a, a mathematician here teaching at McGill University at the time, was uh, called Mr. Gilson. And uh, the portrait was in the family for, for many years and was also given to the museum here. And uh, then this is another aspect also in which I, I think it illustrates what I said, in which we have the tendency to associate beauty with goodness. Uh, I don't want to refer to the most important psychologist on earth who is called Dr. Phil, but yesterday, <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> what he was, <laughs> what he was uh, trying to, to prove to us. Anyway, that, uh, this is a kind of trope, I would say, that you, 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 you see in our culture all the time. Beauty goes with goodness. Uh, you, any Hollywood movie, you can guess by who is the villain, who is the good uh, guy, just by the way they look. Uh. And uh, in fact, it is very, uh, very stupid because again, it's like if you, you have the key, you, you could have beautiful people who are very mean and you can have ugly people who are very generous and good. Uh. Why? Why it should be like this? And this Gilson, in, in, in fact, is a good example of that because he was very involved, in fact, in this museum, in the Conseil d'Administration, uh, the, um, d'Administration, comment on dit? Yeah, the, the board of directors, and uh, he, he was a collector of art, and he was friend of artists and all that. He, he seemed to be quite a nice man, huh? but he looked uh, not uh, not at his best. And and I was surprised to see that in Kant, uh, Immanuel Kant, he says, if we want to represent genius, we should represent somebody who is not completely beautiful, because the beauty, somebody who is beautiful. He says, what is conveyed, it is the, the beauty of the species itself. But if you go to an individual, habitually you will have some difference with, with the model of the species. Uh, and if he's a genius, it will be even more pronounced. I uh, don't know if it works, but, but it's, a, it's a reflection of Immanuel Kant on this. So again, if I conclude, you see, um, we, we did a little bit the same type of... Uh, of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, going by the same steps that we did with the um, so-called racial portrait that we were looking at last time, in which always this, uh, this fascination with a permanent aspect of the portrait of the individual is in front of the painter, um, risk to take over and risk also to create a lot of uh, uh, distortion. The three next lecture, I will try to show you that this permanent aspect have been tried to be defined differently. For instance, from the occupation of the person, uh, wh what he's doing, what is his, uh, uh, his uh, craft uh, and things. And then also the class will be important, so which class he belongs to. And finally, I would see the notion of row, of power, where, where he is in, in front of power. But always the same problematic will be uh, illustrated. Uh, you represent an individual, but you also you want to show some permanent aspect of it, and this is the big challenge of portrait. Okay, thank you.